so now we're just going to have a chat with our, with our six farmers. So these are the guys that actually have to put the ideas that myself and Robert come up with in, into place. And, you know, it's one thing me and Robert standing here telling you what, you can, what you're able to do, but these guys are on the ground every day of the year doing it. So, you know, it's, it's important to hear what they have to say, how they've found the changes they've made this year, what has worked, and equally as important as what, ha what hasn't worked or what would they have, what have they tried and that they would not recommend it to everyone else to do. So I suppose it, like we're still in, in our first year. We're really, we only got in on these farms in January time, so we're only starting to get, get some data under our belts and get some messages to tell everyone. But uh, the main thing is that everything that happens on these farms is, is reported out to the general public. It's all about sharing the message and hoping that everyone ha can pick up something. Uh, from it. So I suppose if we start, the benchmark or, or the whole farm review was probably the first thing that we did with all these guys and I think it was a very worthwhile exercise and I think everyone would agree with that, I hope they would anyway. Um, but you know, the, the information that came out of that and that was done by Kirsten and the SAC there and I think it, it's something that's well worth doing for any business, you know. So before we could see where we wanted to go, we had to know where we were. So uh, it really set out the stall for these guys. So. From there then, if we work through, uh, through the year, I suppose soil fertility was the first thing then we, we tackled. So that was going out, getting soil samples taken, seeing um, kind of what state the health of the soil was in. So I guess lime came back as number one. You know, I think 60% of the soils in the country are, are deficient in lime. So this is something that we've, we've been harping on about again a lot of the year, but um, if we just maybe start with Mark, you at the end of the table, I'm going to pick on you first. So you, you spread a lot of lime, you, you know, your, your soil samples came back. You were kind of pH, what was your, your average pH or was it? Average pH, um, it was about 5.2, I think. So um, it needed to get up to about six and a half. So we, we thought about. Um, uh, how many tons of lime did you spread? Um, we had about 100, 140 tons of lime okay. spray this year. So That was spread in springtime, was it? Some was spread in the springtime, um, and then we had some silage fields that were low in lime as well, so we waited till after the silage was cut, okay. and then we got some lime on then. Really good. Have you seen a difference? Yeah, um, to be honest, one of the silage fields last year was, was quite yellow, um, and this time last year, but this year it's really lush and green, it's made a big difference. Okay, very really good. Moving on, Andy, you're similar, your pH has been quite low. Yeah. It was about high, it was about five for me. Okay. And again, you've spread, what, 200 tonne of lime? Yeah, a tonne of lime. Have you yeah. seen the difference? Uh, <laughs> more to spread this, this back end? Well, see. <laughs> so, we like though, but... Yeah, again, like as we often say, lime is the cheapest fertiliser you can, you'll ever spread. And really, you can't afford not to spread it, because even if you take a, a pH of 5.5, um, a quarter of the nitrogen that you put out on a, on a field that's pH 5.5, or a quarter of the nitrogen is lost, Half of the phosphorus is lost, and you're getting most of the potassium. But you know, you're it's a serious loss in in, in bag fertilizer that you're putting out there. Um, who else was? Uh, and you, you were you were fairly mapped already from being in a fairly arable yeah. system. You you had the soils mapped, so you were okay for. Yeah, for we were we were okay. We end up putting gypsum on blanket spread some gypsum to try and open up the the, the land that was. I think in previous years we put on. Um, Mag lime, which had obviously glued together, I think. And that's what we're putting some of it down to and didn't help with compaction. But so between the aerator roller and the gypsum, we just put in a ton, blanket spread a ton per acre. Um, and uh, it's boosted heaps, whether it's just the season we've had or what it is, I don't know, but um, or the combination of the two, but it certainly made a difference in year one anyway. So. Yeah, so as Robert had said, we went out in, and to dig in, in Andrew's field and it was really just in the top two inches, it was just really sticky and just all, all bound together. So the gypsum, what, what was the rate of gypsum you spread? Uh, a ton of acre, just a blanket okay. spread, yeah. And will you, will you do more, that was just two fields that you did, was it? I think so, no, I did all the, the I didn't do the silage fields. Um, I think next year I'll maybe do half and half, or maybe in the back end if I get a spell just now, I'll do half the silage field just to maybe do a trial and see if it was worth doing or any difference. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it was free to pick up, so it just cost me holes to take up, and so it's... And you got an, an L strong roller then that, that kind of opened up the ground. You were planning on subsoiling initially, but when we did the dig, you know, we found that the, all the problems were in the first two inches, so if you were subsoiling, you'd actually be going under the problem, 
So the Alstrom. I, I subsoiled it five, six years ago, maybe. I just found it took all the stones up to the top, and then it just left holes for feet and stuff like that, just asking for problems. So the um, the Alstrom roller, uh, aerator roller, I bought one of them, and um, again, it just solves it kind of six inch, six eight inches, and yeah, I think it's been all right. It's Need to do it again now with all the weight. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Should we just say on the gypsum? The gypsum doesn't have any liming effect. It's purely there to try and get the magnesium out of the ground and open the ground up. So Ch Charles, if we come to you, your ground, I suppose, in terms of P and K, you're in a very good situation. You know, you're probably, I'd say, that of, of, out of all the farms, yours, your farm is probably the most fertile. You've been looking after it well over the last few years, and, and you would be a great believer in spreading bag fertilizer. And, our job was nearly trying to hold them back a little bit to try and uh, for a little while, but your line was still a quite low in some in some some parts. Really, to 5.4, maybe 5.9. I thought it was about 5.8. Okay. Some of it had never been lined since we went there. Some mm -hmm. of the guys had passed. <coughs> and have you seen a difference since it's gone on? I've seen a big difference. There's mere clover appeared in some of the packs. I don't think some of it would be needed grass or yield. Mm -hmm. But uh, no. Very good. And, and finally, Andrew, here beside me, you, you, your ground is fairly okay, if, if I remember right, for lime, but you needed some? Yes, we were about 5.8, but uh, we did put on 80 tons right. all together, and uh, just to, uh, on the spring barley fields and on the uh, undersown grass fields okay. for next year. Very good. And plan to do more next spring? Yeah, we'll be doing a lot more next spring. Okay. We'll try to get it up to uh, above six if we can. Right. I suppose to say, in all the cases, we didn't sample the whole farm because we only, you can only deal with so much every year, so we just sampled proportion. So uh, all the farms, again, will be lining up more, more fields for soil sampling this back end. So, you know, any time, if you leave it after about uh, three months after your last fertilizer application, you can do a soil sample. That will give you a base level of what, what the nutrients are in the soil. Um, so any time throughout the winter or early spring before you go out with uh, fertilizer is a good time to do that. Um, just moving on then, as we're on, to, on soil, we'll talk about grass next, so maybe rotational grazing. Um, maybe Arthur, I'll come to you, I've left you out in the last one. So rotational grazing, Robert was telling us how, how much grass you grew and how, how many yos you, you ran on a 17 acre park. So let me just run, run through how, how many you ran through on the year and when did they go up and what was the changes throughout the year? We put up uh, 100 hours. 40 ewes in land on the 17 acre. <coughs> we split the park into four, but they didn't get up around the May. We well throw May because the grass didn't jump like ground and took over hell. And then <coughs> when we got grass, it come at an upper speed. And we put ewes and lambs at the first paddock. They got the second in. They were in the first in 10 days. They were in the second paddock. I think a fortnight. The third day they didn't get that because we got that for sewage. In the fourth paddock we had 140 yows, 18 goos in the cars, good night paddock for a fortnight. And it is that bad we got 27 bales of sewage off it. So there's a series of burst of growth when we did get the growth there in spring. So that got early fertilizer, Arthur, earlier than you'd usually spread. I did the winter barley with the 13th of March and I decided I was trying this thing. I decided I would try putting on manure a bit of monsignor and it's fairly working. But saying we got the perfect year for dealing, which helped it. Yeah, so again, the soil temperature was there. So we were out with our soil thermometers every week to see when was this ground going to warm up. So, you know, the soil temperature was there early in springtime. We had a good spring. And again, you know, it might be different next year. It might be later, it might be earlier. But again, it's just about getting the soil temperature once it's at five degrees at 10 centimeters that's when you will get a response to nitrogen application so as soon as we get that again next year next spring uh, we, we'll all be heading out with um, fertilizer but I suppose spring grazing really the plan for it starts this time of year or actually a bit earlier so it's starting about closing up ground um, from probably mid-September onwards to try and retain a bit of the grass throughout the winter so you know you have grass there come springtime to encourage more growth so we kind of have a, an autumn rotation planner on, on most of the farms and, and a plan to close up ground that bit earlier and keep
keep some cover over the winter, don't we, Andy? <laughs> so uh, Andy is still to buy into this um, part yet, but I think he's, gonna, he's willing to try it this year. He's saying that you can't keep grass over winter in Tom and Tool. So uh, we're not talking about ca carrying heavy covers. We're talking about just keeping maybe one leaf on the grass plant so that when you get the, the spring days where it mightn't feel that warm, you get radiation from the sunlight. So if you, ha if you have your little solar panel of your first leaf there, it will take in, in heat and in, in sun, the sun's energy and it'll start growing grass right away. So it's about just trying to get that little step ahead. If, if, we, if we clear everything off this time of year, if the ground is that bit slower to dry out, it's slower to warm up in springtime and, and the, the grass is gonna be that bit slower. So um, that's the plan for this back end. So uh, Andrew, you've fully closed up at this stage. Yeah, everything's done, yeah. Okay, so, so we walked, we walked Andrew's farm earlier on today and I suppose grass growth, grass is still grown in fact on the farm which is, it's a, it's a good complaint but um, you know conditions have been poor the last few weeks so you decided to bring them in. Yeah I mean they, I put, um, I put another 35 kilos of nitrogen on um, was it August um, just to, I'd never done it before but we had a meeting here and we discussed it and thought get some late growth so I did that. And then the weather turned um, with the land I've got at home as well. With the, I did the paddock grazing as well. I had a 27 acre field um, divided into five. I um, had 30, 39 cows on that plus ca um, 14, 15, or 17 calves, I think there was. And that kept them going right through. Um, so, but I had to take them off and I put some young stock on when, when the weather changed. And that's when I put this fertilizer on and then the young stock weren't as good as clearing up the, the grass. That's what the cows were. So we, um, just with the conditions and stuff, we, mm -hmm. we took it off. Yeah, so walking it today, we thought, you know, it's probably another couple of weeks grazing there, but, you know, if the weather turns again, it won't, won't be long turning to, to a bit of a mess again. So we're probably going to hold on that grass and, and try and get your, get your heifers out early next year out to grass and make the most of that. Just in terms of fencing for the rotational grazing, just guys go through how you did it. Mark, again, coming back to you, rotational grazing, how did you split up your field? Just ran um, a couple of, uh, well, it was about 11 stabs and just a single electric wire. Okay, um, that means fencing was around the field anyway. Fencing, yeah, I had mains fencing um, in the field next door anyway, so it was quite easy. Um, I just ran a, a blue water pipe along the inside of the fence and I uh, just took off two water troughs Okay. Um, for that, so that was quite easy as well. So. Okay, so next year, so you had three three grazing divisions this year. Would you increase it next year? Yeah, I've got another um, twenty acre field. I was planning um, cutting it in half as well, um, and there's a ten acre field beside it. So up another three ten acre paddocks, and I might even half them again. So there will be only five acres. Just to give you more control over the grass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you were spending probably got to two weeks in in a. Well, 10 yeah. days anyway. In a well, the, the grass grew really early with us um, in April and we were going to put them out, but then it rained for two weeks. So then by the time it dried up again, the grass was ahead of them. Mm -hmm. um, I also cut one of the paddocks away and got uh, 34 bales of uh, nine acres. Uh, so the 35 cows and calves were only on 16 acres from May until uh, July. And then when the silage is cut, there's obviously plenty, plenty of grazing to move them on if they have to be moved. So. Very good. And, and just Arthur, just on your lambs, how did you keep water to them all year with this, this one field split into four? Was it not a disaster? Yeah, I put it with the D. We just work at a mobile dump, cut water up there, because there's no water in that field with that. <coughs> and the top half, the other thing else, so we just mobile water thing. And, and did they go through much water, Arthur? Do you, do you and lambs drink much water through the yeah, year? We throw a lot of water until the, the week of healing show. And of course, after a good week of the healing show, they didn't drink so much water. You were also um, supplementing your cobalt through through the water tank as well. Yeah, uh, uh, we just put that bag of stuff into the into the, the, the tank and it just dissolves into water. Very good. So, Charles, you're planning to rotation the graze all your sheep next next year. That's the intention since back. So uh, there's about 180 or so yos. Yeah, it was in the lambs and I have over 20 acres in the back. It'll be divided into that. Four or five, I think. Four or five, okay. Yeah, so I think that big. And you're going to use an IBC as well with a... Just an IBC with a top, where... Where... With a wee water trough. A wee trough on it, like in the shift at the road at the... Very good, yeah. 
pick a clean bit, see if it can do. Okay, very good. So those that did the rotational grazing this year, you know, is it something you'll stick with? Was it worthwhile, or is it is it all the fuss over nothing? Yeah, I, I certainly definitely stick with it, and plan on doing more next year. Um, so yeah, definitely. Andy, yeah, yeah. you happy with it? Right. You try. Yeah. Would you split those three fields that you had this year in further, or are you happy with well, the? There'll be silage fields, so if the silage is past, we'll split them up again. Okay. And we'll improve things on the other side. And Arthur, you're convinced? I'm convinced, without a doubt, mate. That's good. Um, and Andrew? I happy? definitely uh, do yeah. some more. Okay. So you're going to increase the number of paddocks next year as yeah. well, yeah? Increase the number of paddocks, yeah. Okay. Okay. So there'll be a, sec a second group. So there's one group that was rotationally grazed this year, will you put your, will you have your second bulling group maybe rotationally yeah, grazed? Sure, yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we move on then to silage quality, which is something again that Robert's alluded to in a lot of the, a lot of the uh, cases here. So silage quality, we're trying to improve again across all the farms. So um, I suppose Andrew, we planned for very early silage with you. Um, maybe we were sitting in your kitchen back in March, and I think we were saying, right, we need to get the need to get fertilizer ordered and get it out fairly quickly. So you know that was a bit of a risk. The weather was cold. It was. You know, so we could easily have shied away from that one, but we didn't. We didn't, and uh, you know, we sort of said, let's try for a cut in May. And everybody thought, well, we won't get a cut in May because we don't usually get silage in May. But we managed to get third week of May, we got the first cut. And the quality of that? The quality was really good, very leafy, yeah. no seed heads at all. So that was an, an Italian ryegrass lay? That was Italian ryegrass, yes. It was 40 odd acres in that, was 40 acres of Italian ryegrass. Okay, very good. And then once that was off, it was straight into for a second cut? Straight into a second cut, which uh, was cut, I think, in uh, July, mm -hmm. beginning of July. Yeah. So that first cut going so early, did you lose a bit of bulk in, in the pit? No, I think we had a good, uh, a good bulk in good crop, crop, really. Okay. The weather was with us as well. Yeah. It's a good spring. Very good. So, again, we've done up winter diets with you, Andrew, and myself and Robert think we're going to have your concentrate, Bill. You're not fully convinced yet, but... Well, we'll have to wait and see on that one, won't we? <laughs> going on the analysis of the silage, we're in line to at least half the amount of concentrate going into your, your young stock there, your growing stock uh, over the winter period. So, you know, that's going to be a massive saving to you. It's going to give you more grain to sell, um, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to take any hit in performance. Your, your cattle are still going to be coming, growing at over the kilo a day, Robert, would it be? Yeah, so we're still planning on, you know, your sale date is sometime in April, isn't it? That's right, yeah. So you'll still be hitting your targets in April, and we're hoping even to increase your sale weights next April. So um, just through better quality silage. Um, Mark, I suppose, Robert went through how, how we manage your grass with, with the environmental scheme as well, and it seemed to work this year. You're happy with the silage that's come out so far? Yeah, I mean, in past years, it's been, it's been short, and it's been uh, too right, but this year we grazed it hard with the lambs. Um, Robert was also happy to see geese on the field, which I was surprised, but never happy to see geese. But uh, they certainly bared it really, really hard, and uh, Sally's quality is way up this year in the last few years, so, so it's you, definitely You working. couldn't get in with uh, fertilizer until what date was it? Yeah, it's 15th of May. 15th of May. We, we can put it on before the 1st of April, but it would just be washed in the yeah. rain. So um, after the 15th of May, we can get our fertilizer on then, and then we can cut it after the 1st of July. So. Okay, very good. Andy? We had some real good quality bales. Max bailed them up while you were on holidays. I think if you were around, they might be still growing. The results is now bought. Yes, <laughs> but that was that was real leafy stuff as well. Yeah, you know, uh, it was slow to start growing. I think it was real dry. Uh, you know, a lot of the people are saying how wet it's been this year. But actually, in Thomondool, you were crying out for rain for a lot of the year, weren't you? It was uh, near rain and very cold. Cold, yeah, cold and dry. June was a hub. Mm-hmm. So that, that was really slow and starting to come, but yeah. it, it didn't, didn't seem that long, but there was a real good bud in it, and it, you know, you did get, how many bales did you get off that, you know? Um, I think you were eight or nine bales per acre anyway. Yeah, it was like 180 or so, wasn't it? Okay, yeah. It was like a thick, I think, Very good, so moving on then, um, some of the other main changes that's been happening on farm. Um, we, maybe we move to the sheep, we don't, haven't talked about sheep all evening, which is a disaster. Um, Andrew, I'm going to go to you. Big changes in ironage for sheep next year. Um, maybe a total swing around in, in the type of yo that you're going using. 
Yes, we're going to a, a mule type of sheep. We want a lighter sheep uh, that's more productive than the half bread. I think the half bread is a little bit, uh, a little bit short on production of lambs. So we've gone for the uh, for the mule on that on that basis. Okay. So, so you just weren't happy with the way the, the sheep fields were performing. In the no, last we weren't years. getting enough lambs for to sell. That's the basics. Okay. Okay. So this new you. So I suppose. On your farm, the sheep is nearly a tertiary uh, enterprise. You've got the cattle is probably number one, or arable, which depends on you or Matthew, whoever you talk to. But then the sheep probably, as in a lot of cases, the sheep come a distant third. Sheep come last, yeah. So they're, they're more of an experiment to us. Really, so we're trying, trying to see how we get on. Yeah. Really, what we're looking for with the sheep is a simple system, you know, as simple as possible. So, you know, they're fairly management free, or as management free as sheep can be. But you want as little input as possible and then get as max. Right. We, we need to lamb outside and the sheep need to lamb themselves. Yeah. That's what we're looking for. So going with you, your, um, your Suffolk Cross and your half that you had been going with, you were finding that they weren't the best of mothers maybe for outdoor lambing in, in tough conditions? They, they were far too big for us to catch hold of out of the field. So we wanted something that we could at least run alongside and catch. <laughs> Very good. That's all right. Um, also on the sheep then, Arthur, you're, you're up in your numbers this year. Um, I suppose in your benchmark year, you sold 1.26 uh, lambs per yo, I think it was. This year, you're in line to sell about 1.56 or 5.7. So, you know, you have a lift in output straight away from the yo's that you have, but you feel you can push numbers as well? Oh, I think we're gone. Huh? <coughs> I'm going to keep it at 100 million yo's. Maybe the try. Very good. So you were two, two, thir two, about 200 last year and it's 300 this year, isn't it? 300, I think, no. Okay, and, and what breeds are they? That's, mule, that's mules, GVT mules, and that's GVT Hemidae for Dingwall to breed with them, GVT mule replacements. Very good. Um, Charles, you, you bought in some gimmers this year as well, is that just kind of, and you sold some of your own, so I just want to go through your, your yours at home. I would have so much GVT mules keep some of the Texels, mm -hmm. and I was getting too much Texels, so some of them were sell on. You were getting <coughs> some lambing problems in? We have quite a bit of lambing problems, big lambs. Okay. Alison likes big tubs. <laughs> <laughs> what else wants she get? I've got hungry to say, I do <laughs> So, Chiviates, you're hoping that you'll reduce your, your lambing difficulty a small oh, bit? I hope so. Yeah. Your lambing fairly early as well. It's we start lambing at the end of February, beginning of March. Yeah. So this year, you're planning it's a little bit later than last year, I think it's going to be. It's about a week later. Yeah. Maybe, aye. Okay. So you're hoping less lambing problems? Fine weather. Fine weather, yeah. <laughs> Same as us all. Um, some breed, breeding season changes then. Of course, move back to the cows again. Like a, lot, a lot of the farms we've, we've tweaked dates that the bull goes out and the bull comes in so we're on about in the, in the other room that we, we have a protected uh, calving season a lot of a lot of cases so you know this year we're allowing a little bit of slippages from what was a late spring we're allowing it to go into an autumn herd but after this year there'll be no more slipping from one herd to the other so if she doesn't go in calf within this, the allotted time she'll be her through the ring next door as well um, so Maybe who has changed their? Arthur, you changed your your the day you let out the ball by about. We were a fortnight later and got in a city ball, and then we we was just a day or twelve there and twelve weeks. Very good. Um, why why did you hold off the ball for the extra couple of weeks in spring? Just to see if we can get him the calf and get a good the peak in the grass like. Yeah, so we're trying to we're trying to match up your peak calving days and, and kind of turn out to, to grass a little bit better so that you know a cow will hit peak lactation between six and eight weeks so we're trying to have that peak lactation at grass so if she's out uh, on spring grass you know she's going to meet her energy requirements there and you're going to get a kick in milk yield and uh, that'll really pay off so you were calving you know there were probably eight to ten weeks before they were getting to to grass and you know it was an expensive time feeding a, a milking cow indoors so that's just a small change there. Um, Andrew, you, you small change as well. You were kind of quite protracted as well. Yeah, I was kind of carving all year round just to um, try and hit different pedigree sales for different different things. Um, so I've tried to put it into two, well, a 10 week in the spring time or 12 week in the spring and just keep some pedigrees um, 
back end calving, more or less just embryos, so they should be calving within a week of each other, um, just to hit the kind of spring sales uh, for bulls, breeding bulls. Um, so do we, I bought an Angus bull as well to put on all my heifers to just maybe try and calve them a wee bit younger. I'm not convinced I'm two year old yet, but I'm getting maybe close, maybe closer steps. towards it. But um, yeah, I got the Angus bull, hopefully try and get some easy calving and um, to go on the limousine cow as well, anything that's not producing very up to kind of a better standard of breeding bulls, I'll just get the Angus bull as well and hopefully reduce calving problems and stuff like that as well. Very good. And Andrew, um, you, you were quite protracted as well, so you were, you had a strict pull, pull out the bull date. What's going to happen? So you're going to scan now, you're just housing at the moment. What's going to happen to those that's not in calf? No, those that are already in calf will be uh, fattened up for, to go barren, and uh, we're hoping to phase out the uh, autumn calvers in the next couple of years and just go to totally spring calving. Okay, so, so again, a large arable unit, you're going to go to more winter crop, so you're going to be busy in winter. Uh, sowing crops and like that, you don't want a, an autumn herd, so you're going to try and up the spring numbers. So, if, if you have some numbers to to call this back end, are you going to put in cows with calves at foot? Are you going to put in uh, bull and heifers? What's the plan to keep output up? Well, we'll probably be buying some in calf heifers, I suspect. Maybe some uh, in calf cows. Depends on the on the uh, whatever's value for money. Whatever's I value for money. Okay. Right. Okay. Just conscious of time. Is there any? Questions or comments there from anyone? Would anyone like to ask the guys anything or ask us anything? Just while you're thinking of your of your questions, I suppose output, you, you heard us on about maximizing output and pushing output from all the farms, and that's kind of the main thing that we're focused on because as, as livestock producers, the only thing we get paid for is kilos that go out the gate. So it's all about maximizing those. Um, so if I just run through the, the all the way along, and just ask the guys, you know, where, where's your, how are you going to increase your output on your farm? So again, Mark, we'll start with you. What's the plan going forward to increase output? Well, I'd like to increase the cows. Um, housing is a bit of a limiting factor. Um, so possibility of maybe another shed. Um, if not, we could maybe um, buy some stores in springtime and maybe try and some of them and try and make some money selling them in the back end. Yeah. Um, it's another option. So. So winter accommodation is a problem at the moment, so yeah. plenty of grass probably through the year, but it's just trying to, trying to make best use of that. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, so you're weighing up the option at the moment of an extra shed for pushing cow numbers, yeah. or the other option, short term anyway, is probably to buy in more stores springtime and sell them again come yeah. September. Somebody did mention sheep, but that's not an option. <laughs> We're still working on that one. Andy, do you want to tell us about your little hairy girls? Uh, as I say, we'll just uh, increase the hill cow numbers, so a little wee hairy things, and mm -hmm. tear up the hill, groove the hill, carry on the sheep, maybe, Mark? With you, Andy, we've a, you know, we've a, a great plan going forward, and it's going to take a while to get there, but, you know, it's a, it's a slow burner, but mm -hmm. we have a plan in place, and, you know, long term, it, it will pay off, so th those, those hill cows, we're starting with 20, there's nothing to say you couldn't get up to 50 hill cows, along with your, your in-by in -by herd as mm -hmm. well. So it's about, you know, these things don't happen overnight, so we keep pushing that. Um, your numbers, are you happy with where they are? Do you think you could run a few more? We'll see how we get, it just pans out. You're leaving it alone for this year? We're leaving it for that just now. Arthur, how are you pushing output? We're going to keep more yows, <coughs> and we're going to keep more goes, but then the other side, we're going to stop growing spring butter. Okay, and so if we can uh, use the extra acres to keep it. The extra goose and the extra yield. And if you if you stop growing spring barley, you're not going to be short of straw and short on barley. No, but if we're paying for barley, if it's costing to grow barley, we could need a bite for less. Okay. And the stray, it's only kind of just going to look for 30 gram of stray. If no, we'll probably wait chip. Okay. Um, Charles, what's the plan? Well, I'd like to keep the keep the coo numbers maybe up. Do you allow us some? Us late coos in the, the end of the year, get rid of them and take it more into our spring covers. Your numbers have increased for this couple of years anyway, maybe touching 200 okay. for this spring. And maybe if we can graze mare on per acre, maybe get an extra pack of barley. Okay, save, so save by as much as expensive stray. It is. So you're trying to increase output from what you already have, nearly in, increase, uh, increase weaning weights, increase sale weights? Well, we're, we're not talking grass this year, it's, mm -hmm. been, it's been quite worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. 
any fertilizer you do spend, spend then you're, you're improving your own ground rather than someone else's. That's right, Tom. Okay. Andrew? Uh, we'll be producing more lambs, I hope, from the, from the uh, same, same amount of ewes as, as we've got. So, okay. So that'll lift our output. Probably yeah. a few more cows. Right. And the switch to winter cereals okay. will obviously produce a, a bit more yield. Yeah. So you, you're, again, you're wean, you wean this year about 1.2 or so lambs per year. So you're hoping this new new yews next year. Well, it'll probably take them a couple of years to bed in being, being young yews, but going well, I, forward. I, I, think, I think because they're mule givers, I think we'll see a, a, a probably an instant result this okay. time. So hopefully we'll get up to 1.6. Very good. Like that. Very good. And then the cows is just trying to get them tightened up into. Yes, we're tighter calving. And uh, calving earlier. You're at about 130 cows there at the moment. Do you see yourself? Do you have capacity to push that anymore at the moment? I, I think we could get up to 150 cows, yeah. Okay. Andrew? Um, I would like to maximise what I can out of my grass at the moment. Um, do, I've got molten barley and that at home as well, so I don't want to go. I want to try and get as much as I can with my grass without putting the place in grass. Um, so try and output that as much as we can. Um, and just see where herd numbers takes us to. I would like to, if we can double them, I'll double them. If not, we'll just... Storage is a, or housing is a problem as well, so it's going to be a bit of an investment with sheds, etc. Have you a number in your head that you'd like to get to? Um, I'd like to have 150 as a starting point anyway. And see if okay. And they're going to be commercial cows rather than. Yeah, I'll want to just I'll just keep the the pedigrees kind of to the to the better lot. I'm not wanting to. Have the rest of them will be the Angus Cross limousine or something somewhere about there. Limousine okay. Cross somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Is there any questions? Yeah, um, one. Hello. I was just wondering with the increase in output, like labour's not readily available and it's quite expensive. Does anybody have any concerns with gonna you know help at lambing time or extra carbon or well I suppose I'll just comment on that first. Again, a lot of the, what we're trying to do is streamline the workload so that, yes, we are calving more cows, or yes, we are lambing more yews, but we're doing it in a shorter period of time so that when we are calving, we're, we're focused solely on calving. So you can do that for eight, ten weeks. You can't do that for 20-odd weeks. You know, so it's about prioritizing the job, having that to do, and getting that done. Um, Labour is an issue on, on all the farms and, you know, everywhere we go, like, you can go, go and visit all these guys now and they have plenty of time to talk to you, but if you go to try and talk to them next March or April, you know, they don't have time to really say hello to you, they're that busy. So, again, it's about streamlining all the systems, um, keeping them as simple as possible, because simplicity just always works. Um, so that's what we're focusing on, on each of the farms. I don't know if any of the guys have, have anything to add to that on workload. Do you think you're at your max capacity, or do you think there's areas that you can improve the way you work? One at a time. <laughs> I, th I think when things are going well, if they all, well, not that they always go well, but there's a possibility of doing, you know, calving some more cows, but uh, labor is still a definite problem. Um, I think if you enjoy it, you can do a little bit more, but, um, there is a limit of what you can do. Yeah, and it comes back to enjoying what you do as well, Mark. As you say, like when we first visited Mark, we couldn't understand why he didn't have a few hundred euros running about the place. But Mark just doesn't like sheep, and like that's it has to be. You have to enjoy what you get up and do every day because you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if you didn't. So that's important too. So you know that it has to come back to that at the end of the day as well. Any last questions? Hi, uh, um, it was just a question on the paddock grazing. I like the concept and everything, but um, a concern I would have, obviously, if you're going to be paddock grazing, you're going to be really raising up your stocking densities. And the summers that we have in Declan, you will come across this coming from where you are. Uh, where you're from, is um, poaching and compaction not a big problem when the weather does break? If everything stocks so heavily and you're utilizing all your ground, you can't really open it up to spread the animals out. So what's, what's the solution? I can agree with that, to be fair. That's a good point. Um, what I did 
I know it doesn't happen everywhere. I had a, had a spare 15 acre field, a grass field that was kind of getting away from some of the lots. I, had to, I put them on another field for that time, but that was the only issue I had. Um, there could be grass there for them at the paddock, but the, the way the, the my land is anyway, the red clay, the grass just gets so dirty they wouldn't eat it. And they would just stood at the gate and rode it. But, but over, the, over the summer, I know it was the, the beginning of the summer was good, but it was like twice, two, three days that happened. And then they were, you put them onto another paddock. I was shifting every Monday, Friday. You could put that down to two days or whatever and change it that way as an option as well. So it's a valid, valid point. Just to comment, Adam, like if, if those cattle are running over 20 acres or five acres, they're doing the same amount of damage, only it's more concentrated in one area. So, you know, you're not reducing the amount of damage that they do by, by opening up all the fields and letting them run around. You, they're still doing the same amount of damage. In fact, you could say they're doing more because they're going to do more walking than if they're in a confined area. So, in my thinking, would you prefer to have a quarter of your field damaged uh, that you right, you have to maybe go in and, and do something after it, or do you want it all damaged to a certain extent? Now, I know you're going to say, well, they're going to blacken it. And yes, they will blacken it. In prolonged poor weather, uh, periods of poor weather, it can be a problem, all right. But if you're talking, you know, a short period, two, three weeks of, of excessive rain, then yes, you're going to take a hit on a certain number of paddocks in your rotation. But overall, you know, you'll get away with poaching ground once a year. You won't get away with poaching it twice. Um, it will recover. It's amazing if you see the, how well ground does recover, and Andrew, you would see that yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. The ground does really recover, you know, as long as you're only hitting that once, hitting it hard. Springtime as well was the cows and calves went out, and the bad weather was you know, forecasting really horrible weather coming in, and just, you know, we didn't push them, we brought them back in for overnight, out overnight, and then. Yeah, I did that at the start of the season, but I think that. The paddock grazing this year, after doing it, you can see exactly how it works. I mean, it's in a good year, but this has been a good year, so I think they need to ask us all <laughs> next year or take a three-year average or whatever you want to do and see how it goes, because you saw what summer's like this year. It's just so up and down, isn't it? So. But the concept works like it. The theory's right, but... Fifteen cows and calves in a fifteen-acre field. I had to take them inside for a week in the summertime. This year I had them in the different field in the paddock to the farm. I had to take them inside, but only for two days. So I still had to take them in, whether it was a paddock or whether it wasn't a paddock. So, Mark, you wouldn't say that this has been an exceptional year at all, would you? you you've had a yeah, but certainly grass growth has been exceptional this year. Uh, but but, but it's been a wet back end, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been really wet in the back end. But once you get your silage cut in July, you've got extra grazing. So if you need to move them to another field, you do have extra room after silage. So. OK. You've all, you've all spoken highly of uh, rotational grazing. And I was just wondering what the feel is, you know, you've, there's some mixed units, sheep and cattle, you've all wanted to increase cows, seems to be a common theme. Would it not be a case, though, if you're getting so much grass, is there not more profit, to, less cost and more profit made from increasing sheep numbers rather than cow numbers? Well, we'll throw that to who's on about up in cow numbers. Um, well maybe if you just go to Arthur, you're up in your yo numbers because you can't... You, your housing is limited for your cattle. Uh, yeah, I could keep it at 15, 20 cows, but that's a <coughs> housing that then becomes a problem. So we're going to pop a yow. Well, I think we're speaking of we're going to 400 yows come time, if we can get away with But it's a housing, it's a problem for me. Cows. Like we have sheds to hide out of 15, 20 mare, but that's it. I could spend a heap of mare money. I suppose it comes back to preference then as well. Like, Andrew, why don't you just stick on an extra couple of hundred euros instead of trying to up your cow numbers? Well, I'm a bit concerned about Brexit, so uh, <laughs> I'd be quite happy to keep them as they are, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's something we have to be aware of, too, with all, with all our guys. is just, you know, as, as, as Phelan alluded to earlier on, the sheep side of things is probably more open to 
are more susceptible to a downturn rather than the beef. Any other last questions? It's the directed towards like the cattle, and um, I was just wondering after all your studies, do you feel that the the size of our cattle is an area for concern up in this area? Because um, oh, well, I just spent five years in Canada, and their cattle, their cow, their beef cows are sitting about 600 kilo mark in, um, and it not only helps the efficiency for the farmer, but also meets the consumer's requirement as well is the slaughterhouses are continually asking us to reduce carcass size, but our carcass size has still increased over the last few years, you know? I was just wondering if that's something you consider or? Yeah, the cow size is definitely, it's, it's a hobby horse of Roberts and I might pass it on down to him, but just something that we didn't actually touch on with the guys that we, we weighed a lot of the, with the cow, like the autumn cows going out to grass this spring and weighed the calves as well. And then we were doing like a weaning percentage. So comparing how many kilos of the cow's weight is she weaning in her calf? And again, uh, Arthur, you did it, Andy, you did it, and we're doing it now as, as they come in for, for the spring herd. And in a lot of cases, it was interesting to see that it wasn't the biggest cows that were weaning the heaviest calves. So I think uh, Arthur and uh, Andy, you both found that very worthwhile. And are you gonna use that going forward to try and to breed from? Each of you was, you know, after you said this afterwards, you, you said this after you, we sent you out the numbers, you went up to the hill, looked at the, you could, you know, you kind of knew the, the cows that had come out badly in the, in the numbers, they, go, they were kind of there niggling in your head anyway. You know, and I mean, and Andy, I've got a cracking picture of that wee coo with a big calf that, you know, it's a fantastic sight to see. Because at the end of the day, you know, body weight is maintenance, body weight is intake. So, again, it comes back to the cost of feed. Charles, I might just get you to comment on that one. You're a fan of big cows. Well, we're selling heifers. It's the big cows. It's big heifers with the calves are selling. You can put in a, a little cow with a good calf into the ring. But some buyers prefer a big cow, so they buy the big cows. So you're just supplying what the market wants at the moment? I try. It's, it's not easy, but I try. Uh, Angus as well into the, the breed because the, the Continental's got its place definitely but you're right with the carcass weights and get this extra fat cover on maybe a bit cheaper and keep a smaller cow as well so it's another reason for me introducing that. Yeah, the vigour of the calf, the, the, hail, the whole job but I selected a bull, I'm not a man for figures at all but I selected a bull for milk figure and right or wrong I don't know, I'll see. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Robert? Well, I have a question from somebody who's not here tonight but can ask me to ask the question, which is kind of more directed to myself and Declan, is why we didn't look at return on capital as opposed to, you know, basically our, our targets are all around gross margin per head. But at the end of the day, a profitable business is a business that works, and this guy was basically asking why are we not going for return on capital. So just and then just to fulfill his question, because I know he's, he's sitting watching at the other end of the, the camera, so I better ask his question for him. Basically, we chose gross margin per head on the basis that we've done these gross output analysis, we have the profitability of the farms, and we've looked at what is the best effect. The fact of the matter is they've all got pretty decent gross margins. So if you've got a good gross margin, driving output is what will actually make the difference on the farm. More gross margins makes more money, dilutes the fixed costs, drives the profit up. You know, you've heard each and every one of these guys talking the fact they are going to drive their business, the numbers up, they are all going to push on, and that's the only way we're going to sort this, the cost out. I know I take the labour point, I take the stocking density point, but the fact of the matter is, more animals, more kilos, more cash. That's a perfect sum up, <laughs> Robert. Um, right, so just, um, I want to thank the six guys sitting up here, they were skull dragged up here um, and had to be, you know, no one likes sitting up in front of a crowd, so I just want to thank them for being so open about, about their farms. 
I want to thank their families because this is a very much a family operation, each of the six farms. There's Trojan work done by each farm member, or each family member on the farm. It's by no means a, a one-person job. Um, I also want to thank them for how open they've been with me and Robert over the last few months. Um, you know, and they've a, never chucked us out once. Multiple t cups of coffee and sandwiches. Close ones, um, so that's all I have to say. I think Kieran Maley is going to wrap up the whole evening now. Uh, so over to you, Kieran. Thanks for taking it. Yeah, I'd just like to extend the thanks to the farmers as well, and especially for the commitment that they give to the program since it's launched back in February time. I'll try and talk slow so that you can hear me. Unless you're, unless you're off man, five miles of the radius, I'll keep it, and, and you can understand the fast voice. But listen, uh, look at someone up here tonight. They say the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And as farmers, only you can take that first step. By that, it means like feel them outlined realistically where we're going with single farm payment. I'd say the only certainty that'll come out of Brexit or whatever way it goes is it'll be less. You know that yourselves. So how long do you delay making changes? Because only you are responsible for your farm. People can offer you advice like these two lads give to these six farms. They have to take it on board. It's up to them to make the changes. Same applies to you. If you want to be profitable in farming, you have to make a change. There's no point in looking to your neighbour. He'll not keep you in business. He wants to keep himself afloat. So that's what you have to do. And the good thing is, look at, you see the six lads here. They're putting out information in the paper every week. And there is small changes can be made. Small changes make big changes. That's what they say. I suppose, look, if you think, going into the, the, de the demo that we had there, like uh, the two calves, the January and the July born calf, nobody's saying there's nothing wrong with calving cows in the months of May, June and July if that's the right system for your farm, if that's what you can make the most money out of. But remember, if you're going to do that and you're carrying a calf through to about December, January, February time on the cow, you have to be top class silage for the next part of the winter. If you want to know is your silage good enough, think to yourself, what a milkman feed it to his cows. Cows have the same physiology, whether they're Holstein freezing or continental beef cows. They take the energy and protein out of grass, they make milk. So if you're cutting silage in the middle of July to get as much bulk as possible, and you're in a late summer calving, early autumn calving, you needn't think it's going to drive milk production in cows. That's where you start to lose all the way with you. The, the, the cost difference there about 100, 350 pounds between those two calves, that's at the extremes. So if you split the difference down the middle, that's the first calf, the last calf, about 175 pounds either side of the calf, or the calf average. Take out your top bottom 10%, 100 cows, that's 10 calves, that's 1,700 pounds that basically, you know, that you're potentially losing out that as opposed to your herd average. Always talking your herd averages. When you go home tonight, you go home tomorrow, whatever it is, thinking your cow's born in March, what weight are they? They're about 200 days of age, an acceptable weight for a suckler cow that we all talk, we all think serious value of our cows. Our cows are great. My stock bull is the best bull I can buy. About 1.2, 1.3 kilos of live weight a day. At 200 days plus its birth weight, them cows should be about 310, 320 of an average across the herd at that kind of calving date. What percentage of your herd is at that level? Very, very simple schematics. And that's what I say, that's what it comes down to. If you listen to what the two lads said and the feeding values from that January, February born calf as opposed to the July one, pound of difference of feeding the cow plus a pound 50 on the calf having the winter through to February time. Over them bottom 10 calves, that's another 250 pound per calf and cow unit over 100 days to the end of February. There's two and a half grand plus about 1,700 pounds there that you're missing on your average calf sales. Plus that in the straw, there's nearly five grand. Small savings starting to add up. What would that do to your farm business? That could be 10, 15% of your single farm payment. That's, that's, those are figures, like, and they're not hard to achieve, as, as I say, but you have to be responsible to start to make those changes. And you have to be honest about the value of your stock, because as I say, only you can make those, those changes. Look at, very, very simply, farming is a business. If you run it for profit, you have to treat it like a business. That's it in a nutshell. And last thing at last, don't be afraid of change. Change can be good. Don't make silly changes, absolutely. The outcome has to outweigh the problem in that you have to get more out of it than was actually where you were at the start. Base your decisions, base your changes on actual facts. Weigh your cattle. No point coming in cattle in here tomorrow. That's the first weight you've seen go I'm down 50 kilos in last year. Could you have made a bad difference earlier in the year? Only you can answer those questions. Based on actual information, your calving interval, what is your feeding, what is your silage quality? Early, early action on that information. 
And that's what returns figures. That's what returns money in your pocket. That's how any business works. I suppose, look, the last thing here I'll just say is, it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue for the Farmer's Journal that there's something they're very serious about, is farm safety. You're coming into the winter period, you have a limited daylight to get jobs done. The temptation's there to cut corners. A lot of machinery moving through the yards, winter feeding. Farm safety, thinking yourself, are you the single breadwinner for your family? You get injured by cutting corners. What happens to your family? What happens to your farm business? Always bear that in mind. Look, last thing's last. Um, the information in the programme goes out every week through the paper and online. The journal, keeping a bit of house and just basically plugging the journalists I'm from, there's subscriptions available to the journal at reduced rates. Uh, they're on offer here. You can talk to someone at the back of the steps. That's if you're interested in taking one out. I would encourage you to do it because the value of the information that you're getting here is actual data, it's actual costs, it's actual farmers doing something different over three years. So look at, there's a cup of tea outside for everybody. Uh, you're welcome to come and talk. If not, I wish everybody a safe home and thanks for coming.